Okay, in this lecture, we want to talk about uh, the difference between single crystal materials and polycrystalline materials. So um, I want to go through first and just define what is a single crystal material. And all that is, is if we have a material sample that has some constant lattice structure throughout, so the lattice structure that we've talked about, whether it's BCC or FCC or HCP, if those just continue to repeat over and over and over again without break, without sort of any hitting any boundaries or changing uh, directions or anything like that, if that uh, lattice structure persists throughout, we call that a single crystal because it's, uh, it, it's all part of a single lattice, okay? Now, what I'm showing you here on, on the, this image, this is a, a image from a transmission electron microscope. And so you can see this is a, a scale bar of three nanometers. And this is for looking at uh, silicon atoms. And you can see that the, the, the lattice that the silicon atoms are forming, and you can see that it's repeated throughout. So that's an example of a single crystal, okay? So one thing to note about single crystals is that they're very difficult to fabricate. Uh, it requires uh, extremely careful process control, things like clean rooms, uh, vacuum deposition, which means that all of the air is evacuated out um, so that there's no possible way to contaminate uh, w the sample that you're creating. Okay, And the reason that we do all that is that single crystal growth, uh, uh, to get a single crystal, we require growth uh, from a single nucleus, okay? Because otherwise, if we have um, multiple nuclei growing together, they won't necessarily form the same lattice, right? They're going to come together and form some kind of a boundary, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, how about properties of single crystals? So we've talked about FCC and BCC and HCP and kind of shown you some other um, other structures as well. But in a single crystal, properties are typically what we call anisotropic. Uh, hopefully you've heard this phrase before, but I'm going to remind you of it. Uh, what that means is that the property value uh, is dependent on the direction that we measure. So here's a here's an example uh, to illustrate that. Let's think about the elastic modulus uh, in BCC iron. Okay, so normally when you think of a piece of iron that you might get at the machine shop, you know that it doesn't really matter uh, which direction you pull on that uh, piece, it's going to have the same properties in, in all directions. But at the single crystal level, uh, the, the modulus or the, the, the stiffness that you get by pulling on that single crystal, let's say, along an edge direction, so uh, in this case, pulling it along this, you know, the, uh, this, this would be your uh, something like a, a 100 direction, pulling on it in that direction, gives you a one modulus of elasticity, in this case 125, whereas pulling on it in the diagonal of this BCC material, it's going to give you a modulus of 273. So significantly different modulus values depending on the direction that you pull. Now, if you remember uh, what the modulus of iron actually is, uh, you would typically report it as something in between there. And again, we'll talk about what that is. But the bottom line is that in a single crystal, usually properties are anisotropic, meaning that the direction that you're measuring them uh, affects the property that you measure. Okay. <clears throat> one more thing I want to mention about single crystals is that sometimes a compound or an element can have more than one single uh, crystal structure, rather, that it forms. And, and uh, it's going to typically be something that happens at different temperatures, but not always. Um, and when the, the fact that they have multiple structures is what we call polymorphism or uh, allotropy. Okay, so a classic example is iron, right? So again, I'm, this is going to be used throughout. Turns out that, that the polymorphism of iron is going to be one of the key features in uh, a lot of our heat treating of steels, a lot of our choice of how we um, uh, process steels in general because we're trying to achieve uh, particular properties that can only be achieved by us moving from one crystal structure to another. Okay, so let me give you a temperature line here. And in, in the iron system, there are three critical temperatures, 912 degrees C, 1394 degrees C, and 1538 degrees C. Below 912 degrees C, uh, the iron system forms what's called alpha iron, and it's a body-centered cubic structure. That's the, the typical structure that we talk about for iron. Uh, 
at between 912 and 1394 degrees C, it forms the gamma phase, which is a face-centered cubic phase. And then above 1394, it goes back to body-centered cubic, okay? And then above 1538, we get to a liquid, right? And, and I'm, not, I'm not going into why these are important yet. I'm just telling you that they exist, okay? Um, one thing that you're going to find is that we can put a lot more carbon into iron in the gamma phase than we can at the alpha phase. So one thing that we might want to do is uh, load up a bunch of carbon in the gamma phase and then cool it to the alpha phase. And we'll talk about uh, uh, sort of what happens when we do all those kinds of things to control the microstructure of steel. Another classic example of a material that has multiple um, possible structures is carbon, right? And I think you probably know that. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but carbon can form graphene, which you may have heard of. It's kind of a, a hot new material right now because uh, they're able to, uh, people are able to do things like dope it to get um, uh, very high uh, electrical conductivities. Uh, it kind of is like a viewed as almost like a super material right now. Um, I, I'm even though I'm somewhat skeptical of its long-term use. But uh, nanotubes also something that you probably heard of. Uh, they can form fullerenes, uh, diamond. Um, maybe maybe you have a diamond ring, <laughs> that, that's carbon obviously, but it's not in the same form as the lead in your pencil, which could be graphite, right? So um, those are five different structures that carbon can, can adopt. Those are all allotropes of uh, carbon. Let me bring up one more, uh, and that's tantalum. And the reason I bring that up is because this is one that I've personally worked on a lot back when I was uh, doing my PhD at Cornell. Uh, my group was, uh, one of the projects in my group was focused on uh, and looking at the phase transformation between uh, uh, tantalum from its normal BCC phase, which is alpha, so I'm showing you a BCC alpha tantalum. But when we were depositing it uh, in thin film form, so that means that we would basically create a, uh, we, have, we, we would buy a target of tantalum, we would hit it with plasma, we would sputter atoms onto a very, very clean surface and, and create very high quality uh, single crystal, not single crystal maybe, very high quality films of tantalum on that. And and when we were creating them in that fashion, we would actually uh, sometimes be able to create a different um, uh, crystal structure, much more complex. In this case, we called it beta tantalum. Uh, and it's a complex tetragonal phase. Obviously, we're not gonna talk about something this complex in this class, but the bottom line is that uh, the allotropes exist all around us, and in many cases, they're they're critical for our engineering applications. And and I say in this class, we're going to spend most of our time talking about uh, how significant uh, these these uh, allotropes are when we when it talk, comes to processing the the uh, steels uh, in the iron carbon system. Okay, so now I've told you a lot about single crystals. Uh, if you're if you're racking your brain, going well, where do we ever use single crystals? There are a few applications, even though, as I said, they're kind of expensive uh, to to create, very difficult to create. So they have to be, yep, you have to want to, to put them in there. Um, the first that's probably the most common is in turbine blades or veins uh, for gas turbine engines, okay? And the reason is because uh, we get an enhanced creep resistance by using single crystal blades. Um, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about why that is later, and you'll learn a lot more about it in the in the class on uh, the mechanical behavior of materials uh, uh, next semester in your in your studies. But basically, this is showing you um, the this this is a turbine vein right here, or turbine or turbine blade, and this is the the surface. Uh, so you're looking at the structure here. So this is kind of a zoom in of what the actual surface is. You have a single crystal alloy. Then there's some sort of a bond coat, and then you have a ceramic thermal barrier. Okay, the reason that that the uh, the single crystal alloy works is because uh, it prevents as 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 uh, gas turbine engines run very hot, uh, it, it prevents the the long term creep growth um, along that um, uh, blade. Okay, and so. Uh, if this what I'm showing you here came from a NASA plot showing you the year that was developed versus the temperature capability um, that was de that was controlled by the creep life uh, at 137 uh, megapascals. Okay, so back in the you know 40s and 50s, our our te temperatures could run you know around up to like let's say 850 or something like that. Uh, 
and until we got to these these red squares are just conventional casting blades then then we moved to the green which were directionally solidified but then these blue curves or these blue points are single crystal blades which you can see we've been making since the 1980s but they give us a significant um, temperature enhancement uh, over non-single crystal blades um, purely it's, it's driven by creep the other place that you are uh, you, you know, you've experienced um, single crystals is in silicon uh, the fact that you're watching this video on a computer means that you're using silicon single crystals uh, in there. So single crystal silicon is used for semiconductors, gives you, it, it permits very um, high quality control over the doping and the electronic properties of that. So what these are actually, these are long billets of silicon, and then they're sectioned, they're cut into discs like you see here. And then those discs are uh, processed uh, in, in such a way uh, uh, using uh, photolithography to create uh, the transistors and things like that and the, the, the circuit uh, chips and whatnot that you see in your electronics today. So that's another common example of single crystal applications. And the final is less less precision, but you may have uh, used these. Uh, you know, I come from a construction background, and so we certainly use diamond blades uh, in construction. Uh, those diamonds are single crystal and they're embedded into the blade to give you uh, exceptional hardness, right? So those are three um, common examples of single crystals that you'll see in in um, uh, kind of an application. Uh, not the only ones, but, but uh, certainly probably the most important, okay? So what happens if it's not single crystal? Well, most materials aren't single crystal. When we know that because you don't you don't care about what direction your steel bar is being loaded because you know it's the same properties in all directions, so something must be different. So the majority of crystalline solids are actually comprised of many single crystals that are agglomerated together, and we call that a polycrystalline material. So here what I'm showing you is a niobium hafnium tungsten plane, uh, plate rather, with, a, with an E-beam weld. So here's your, here's your length scale of one millimeter. Uh, and, and these different colors correspond to different single crystals. Um, so they are, uh, presumably, they are different orientations, but they also could be different crystal structures uh, depending, okay? But the bottom line is that every color is an individual crystal, okay? So what you see is that you have small crystals and large crystals, and each single crystal in the material we're gonna call a grain. And the sizes of grains and materials can range from on the order of nanometers all the way up to the order of centimeters. So they can span a dramatic, you know, that, that would be like a seven order of magnitude um, a span of size, okay? Again, going back to our processing uh, of, of things like steels, a lot of our heat treatments and things are designed to control the size of grains and the regularity of grain sizes, okay? So in this particular instance, uh, you have large grains, and then you have tiny grains, and that's actually not ideal. A lot of times we want to normalize the grain size, and we'll talk about how we do that in steels. Um, the boundary between the individual grains is called a grain boundary. And then how about properties? What do we think about properties in this material? This is kind of a bad example because uh, because it's a weld, it kind of ran in a single direction. But if you think about maybe properties in this where all these tiny grains are, uh, what you're going to find is that the properties are typically isotropic, right? So that means that they're the same in all directions. Um, even though the individual crystals, in any particular color that we would choose there, they're anisotropic. But in aggregate, as we clump them all together and they're all rotated randomly, they typically behave the same in all directions because of all of them clumped together, okay? So, uh, for example, now go back to our, our iron example. If you remember, we showed one direction along the diagonal giving us for iron a modulus of 273 GPA, and then along the uh, the 100 direction was 125. But if you measure the modulus of polycrystalline iron, which would kind of be what your iron bar would be, you'll get a modulus of about 210 GPA, okay? In terms of fabrication, uh, as you might expect, we fabricate um, single crystals from a variety of nuclei, and as they grow together, then they they form uh, at their boundaries. They form grain boundaries, and they and they give you what you see in this picture. Okay, something like that. 
So they all grow together. Uh, this is the, the most common way uh, that, that materials form, uh, but there are ways that we can uh, process these to control uh, how big the grains are, uh, maybe even sometimes the shape of the grains and those kinds of things. We'll talk about those as we move on, but we don't really have all the the um, the tools yet to talk about that. We need to talk about things like defects. We need to talk about things like um, uh, dislocations uh, and whatnot so that we can uh, kind of properly understand how all of this fits together. Okay, so those th that's the distinction between single crystal and polycrystal. Now we want to talk uh, in our next lecture about how are we going to... Uh, look at, take a piece of material and decide what its crystal structure is. How in the world did a map like this ever get generated where we could actually look and say, oh, this, there's, this location has a different crystal structure than some other location. I want to talk about that. Okay, so hopefully that's straightforward and, and we'll uh, slide into that in, in the next lecture.